Thanks everyone. Uh, so this week uh, we are planning to cover the sixth chapter of the ICLR, uh, which is on linear model selection and regularization. Uh, in the previous chapters, we covered uh, resampling methods and we'll be using uh, some of the concepts from there. Uh, and uh, this chapter will also look at linear regression uh, fundamentals. So this is the last chapter uh, in this book that talks about uh, linear uh, methods. We will soon be moving to non-linear methods from the next chapter. In terms of the learning objectives, uh, uh, we have three primary objectives. The first one is to learn about uh, subset selection methods. Uh, so this whole chapter talks about how we can uh, reduce the number of coefficients or shrink the number of coefficients so as, so as to reduce the variance uh, in our models. And the first method, uh, which corresponds to the first learning objective, is to uh, identify uh, the best set of subsets uh, or, or uh, best subset selection method. Uh, the next set of methods is around uh, shrinkage uh, methods, which try to shrink the coefficient estimates towards zero uh, and, and therefore try to reduce uh, variance in that way. And finally, we have a, a dimension, a set of dimension reduction methods, which reduce the number of dimensions by uh, sort of projecting the predictors into, uh, into a set of new components. Uh, so before we dive in, uh, I, the context for uh, at least the, the context for this chapter, uh, before we begin the context for this chapter, uh, I plan to cover the uh, conceptual parts of all of these methods today and then uh, dive into exercises uh, the next week. I uh, uh, hope that is uh, okay with everyone. So before diving in, uh, the context for this chapter is that, uh, you know, in the regression setting, uh, the OLS uh, or, the, or the least square uh, equation, which uh, says y uh, is given as a combination of uh, coefficients, uh, uh, beta naught through beta p. Uh, and the question now arises, why should we think about constraining or removing uh, these predictions? Now, we know that linear models have a very low bias, uh, assuming that there is an approximately uh, linear relation between the response and the predictors. And this is this specifically holds true when n is very large. That is, the number of uh, cases that we have in the data is much larger than the number of predictors. Uh, however, when uh, the number of predictor becomes quite large, that is, when the number of predictor is equivalent to the number of uh, cases in the data. Uh, uh, least squares fit gives us a very high uh, variance and it tends to overfit the data, which leads to very poor predictions. Uh, at the same time, when uh, P becomes much larger, uh, when the number of predictors becomes much uh, larger than the number of uh, cases that we have in the data, we no longer have a unique least squares estimate. And uh, that leads to infinite variances and these squares cannot be used in that setting at all. Uh, so, so these uh, considerations or these kinds of settings uh, necessitate us to uh, think about methods which can uh, constrain the predictors in some way or remove specific predictors from our models in a data-driven way so that we can uh, have a model which is feasible and also has low variance. Uh, secondly, another important point of consideration is model interpretability. Uh, many predictors uh, that we use in uh, models, specifically machine learning models, become uh, are, are irrelevant and, and not super uh, predictive of the response. Uh, and including those predictors in the model can lead to unnecessary complexity uh, and removing uh, those models in a data-driven way can uh, lead to, can help us in an easier interpretation. So that's one more reason for us to think about these methods uh, uh, beyond uh, prediction accuracy and, and uh, thinking about increasing model interpretability. Uh, 
so as I said earlier, three approaches to uh, constrain or remove these predictors are discussed. In the chapter, the first set of methods is subset selection, which is uh, to identify a subset of predictors uh, that are related to the response. The next set is uh, shrinkage methods, which fit a model using all predictors, but then try to shrink the coefficients towards zero. Uh, uh, which uh, leads to reduced variance. And finally, dimension reduction, reduction methods, which project the set of P predictors to an M dimensional uh, subspace, uh, where M is uh, much lesser than uh, much lesser than P, uh, which means that the number of dimensions that we are using is much lesser than the total number of predictors that we are feeding into the model. Uh, so with that brief overview, uh, I will jump into the subset selection uh, technique. And uh, so subset, subset selection methods uh, are a group of methods that directly reduce the number of predictors. Unlike some of the other methods that we'll be talking about, this is purely selecting a set of, a subset of all the predictors that we have uh, provided to the model. Uh, the, uh, one of the approaches is called the best subset selection uh, approach. Uh, this is the most straightforward approach. Uh, the idea here is that uh, we are fitting uh, a se separate least square regression uh, for each possible combination of the P predictors. Uh, so given a set of, let's say we have a set of 10 predictors, we will uh, we'll, we'll think about all the possible combinations of P predictors, starting from just one predictor each, uh, then a combination of two predictors, then a combination of three predictors, so on. Uh, and then we will fit all of these models and select the one that is the best uh, of them all. Uh, so a simple example is, let's say we have, we start with 10 predictors. So first, we'll, first we will fit a model which has one of those 10 predictors each. So we'll have 10 such models. Uh, then in the next uh, iteration, we'll, we'll select a combination of two out of those 10 predictors. Uh, so we'll choose two out of the 10 uh, uh, predictors that we are starting with. Uh, and that would give us uh, 45 new models to consider. And this will go on for, uh, for, for P going from, uh, for K going from uh, one to 10. Uh, the next section summarizes this algorithm. Uh, so we start with the null model M0. Uh, and then for each K going from one through P, uh, we uh, fit all the models coming from P choose K. Uh, and then within that, for that specific value of K, we choose the best model where best is defined as having the lowest uh, residual uh, sum of squares or the lowest uh, deviance, etc. Uh, so for each k, as this algorithm says, we'll have one best model uh, that uh, goes from, let's say, m1 through mp. And then finally, we will choose the best of all of these models. So uh, for each K, we had uh, a model going from M1 through MP. Uh, and then we also had the null model M0. So finally, at the last step, we are choosing the best model amongst uh, all of these models that we have from M0 through MP. Uh, and here, this is defined as uh, uh, a CP or a, or a AIC or a BIC or a cross validated NMC uh, or, or some other parameter like that. Uh, the pros and cons of this method is that uh, the, the clear advantage here is that it selects the absolute best subset, which performs, uh, uh, which gives us the best performance. But as you can imagine, this is computationally very, very expensive. Uh, uh, for, e for a set of predictors P, this approach fits two to the power P uh, uh, models, um, and that can that can take a lot of toll on the computational power. Uh, an alternative to the best subset selection strategy is uh, stepwise selection. Uh, there are two types of stepwise selection strategies: uh, a forward stepwise selection and a backward stepwise selection. The forward stepwise selection, as the name suggests. Uh, 
uh, starts with a null model and then uh, keeps on adding one uh, predictor at a time and uh, and selects the best algorithm. Uh, uh, forwards and and as well as backward, they are computationally much more uh, efficient as compared to the best subset selection strategy that we just saw. Uh, as an example, uh, the best subset uh, strategy uh, consists uh, consists considers two to the power p possible models, uh, whereas uh, a stepwise selection strategy would would choose uh, would select would, would fit one model for as the null model and then uh, p uh, into one plus p over two uh, models uh, overall. Uh, and as an example, if we have 20 predictors, uh, the best subset selection strategy would, would sort of fit around 1 million models, whereas the forward subset selection uh, will select only about 200 models. So, so there's a clear advantage of using forward subset selection over best subset selection. Uh, the algorithm goes something like this. Uh, we, we again start with a null model, just like we did in uh, best subset selection. And for each k going through one, uh, going from one through p, we first fit all the p minus k models and we keep on adding one predictor uh, to this model. And for that k, we then, we then select the best predictor uh, again, this being defined as the smallest RSS or the highest R square. Uh, and finally, we'll have like a subset of, uh, finally, we'll have a set of models coming from each of these K values. Uh, and we'll uh, plus the null model M0, and we'll select the model uh, uh, that gives us the best performance based on uh, a cross validation uh, prediction error. Uh, so that was the approach for uh, forward stepwise selection. And as we can imagine, uh, we also have backward stepwise selection. We start with uh, the full least squares model with all the predictors, and then iteratively remove the least useful predictor one at a time. So comparing the algorithms, uh, we first have, instead of M0, we have MP, which denotes the full model with all P predictors. And then we start from k going going from p through one, uh, which indicates removing one predictor uh, at every iteration. Uh, and for each value of k, uh, we first consider all k models that result in dropping a single predictor, uh, and uh, that results in k minus one predictors at each stage. And, and for each value of k, we then choose the best uh, among those models, uh, best being defined as the smallest RSS or the highest R square. Uh, and so that's the best sub subset selection. And we also have something called a hybrid uh, subset selection or a hybrid approach, which combines both of these uh, with uh, uh, variables added sequentially, but after adding you, we can remove these variables that do not provide any improvement in the fit. Uh, so this set of methods, as we see, gives us uh, an option to directly reduce the number of predictors. Uh, so this is great when uh, we, we have like a lot of predictors and we need to choose a few predictors that, uh, uh, that will be uh, predictive of our, that, that are relevant, that will lead to easier interpretation, that would also lead to better model performance. Uh, and where we, we are not really bothered about how, bothered about keeping all of the coefficients or keeping all of the predictors in the model. Uh, so this brings us to the question of how, how do we choose the most optimal model or what is the most optimal model? So, this creates a problem, and this problem is uh, a familiar one. We have been looking at it in the previous chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, what happened? What is happening is that RSS and R square are not suitable for selecting the best model simply because uh, they, uh, they, I mean, they will always have uh, small RSS and uh, highest R square, uh, 
uh, if we have all the predictors <laughs> correct. Uh, but uh, as we saw in the previous chapters, we uh, we need to estimate the test errors uh, as well. Now there are two uh, approaches to that. The first one is uh, to use an indirect method to estimate test error, uh, which is also called adjustment uh, methods. And the second one is very familiar. We have been using it in the previous chapter, uh, which is to directly estimate the test, test error using uh, a validation set or a cross validation approach. Uh, I'll quickly go through the adjustment methods. Uh, the core concept here is that uh, Training set MSC will generally be an underestimation of the test set MSC. Uh, this is obviously because the training set estimates coefficients in a way that uh, that that is specifically minimizing the training uh, RSS. Uh, so what ends up happening is that the training error will decrease as more variables are included in the model, uh, whereas the test error might not uh, reproduce the same. Uh, reduction in MSC, uh, as we have seen in some of the graphs in chapter five. Uh, so, so we cannot really use the training RSS. However, we can use a number of techniques to adjust the training error uh, based on the model size. Uh, so there are a few common adjustment methods the, uh, or sort of parameters. So one is the CP, uh, which is one over N, uh, uh, multiplied by the RSS plus uh, 2k sigma square, uh, where uh, sigma square is the estimate of the variance of the error associated with each response. Uh, and k is the number of predictors that should have been a D. Uh, but what we realize here is uh, that uh, the uh, even the other adjustment methods like AIC or BIC, they uh, are also directly proportional to the number of predictors D. Uh, this means that more the number of predictors, greater these errors. Uh, and finally, we have adjusted R square, which is uh, one minus the RSS over the total sum of squares uh, multiplied by n minus one over n minus D minus one. And in this case, we see that D is in the denominator, which means that higher the uh, number of predictors used in the model, lower the adjusted R square uh, will be. So yeah, so these techniques can be used if we want to go, if we, if we, if we choose not to do cross-validation methods. Uh, but as we know, we, we, we have uh, uh, cross-validation uh, techniques in our uh, pockets and we can always uh, use some of those direct ways to estimate uh, test error. Uh, yeah, uh, so with that, I think that's a that's a quick summary of the subset selection methods. I wanted to take a pause here to see if uh, anyone has any questions or uh, anything to add uh, to this discussion. Yeah, we just to add that we need to be really, really careful with these methods as the step of using the residual standard, the residual standard squares, the RSS uh, mm -hmm. is a problem, as you know, is from the training data. And even though you make all the computations, uh, you might have a overfitted model, try that the best one. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I, okay, moving on uh, to shrinkage methods now. So, so we saw that in subset uh, selection methods, we have this opportunity to uh, uh, we have this option to sort of reduce the number of predictors and they, they uh, should be used with uh, caution, as Angel just said. Uh, we now move to the next set of methods which do not shrink, uh, or which, which do not uh, reduce the number of predictors directly, uh, but use a shrinkage technique to uh, reduce the variance. 
And uh, what is happening here is uh, that we are adding a penalizing factor or we are penalizing each model for having a lot of uh, coefficients. Uh, and we are allowed, as users, we are allowed to choose the, uh, the, the amount by which we are, we are going to shrink or, or we want or, or we uh, shrink the coefficients towards zero. So in, and there are two types of uh, shrinkage methods. One is the ridge regression and the second one is the lasso regression. Now the core idea here is that uh, for an ordinary least square uh, method, RSS uh, or the residual sum of squares is uh, given by this first formula under 6.2.1 here. Uh, and what is happening is while estimating the beta naught, beta one or beta P, uh, uh, the idea is to minimize the residual sum of squares given in this uh, equation above. So to estimate beta naught through beta P, we are minimizing uh, this RSS. Uh, Ridge regression is very similar uh, to this, except that the, co the, the coefficients are estimated by minimizing a slightly different value. Uh, so in, instead of minimizing RSS, we are minimizing RSS plus lambda times sigma beta j square. So that's the, that's the difference between OLS and ridge that the coefficients for OLS are estimated by minimizing uh, the RSS, whereas coefficients of ridge regression are estimated by minimizing RSS plus lambda times uh, sigma beta j square, where lambda is the tuning parameter that I was uh, mentioning about uh, a, a while ago. Uh, and uh, this is the parameter that we determine separately. So this, this quantity lambda times sigma beta j square is called a shrinkage penalty and lambda is the tuning parameter. Uh, now, as we can see, when lambda is zero, uh, it's the same as doing a ordinary least square uh, regression. So when lambda is zero, we have no shrinkage penalty applied to the model and the coefficients would be exactly the same as obtained from a OLS regression. However, when lambda becomes or takes higher values, uh, the uh, minimizing uh, the equation above would make the coefficients tend to zero. Uh, and that's the idea of ridge regression. If we, if we use higher values of lambda, uh, we'll have much smaller uh, coefficients. So we can see visually from figure 6.5 in the book, uh, that as lambda increases, uh, the, the squared bias, which is given in the black, that also increases. Uh, the variance, which is in green, uh, that decreases. And the test mean squared error, which is this purple, it first decreases and then increases. Uh, so this essentially, uh, and, and, and the horizontal lines uh, indicate the minimum possible value of uh, the mean uh, squared error. Uh, so this means that as we, keep, as we move uh, the value of lambda from zero through higher, there comes a point which, which gives us like a really low uh, mean squared error. Uh, and we can select that uh, as the lambda that we choose for our model and get a model which has really low mean, uh, low test MSEs. Uh, and uh, one of the considerations here is that uh, since the set of coefficients obtained from ridge regression are scale invariant, uh, so it's a good idea to standardize all of the predictors before performing uh, ridge regression. Uh, the uh, uh, another concept here is uh, the, the concept of L2 norm. Uh, so in the figure to the right of this, uh, in figure 6.5, uh, we have this uh, uh, we have this value of uh, uh, beta lambda two over uh, over beta beta hat two, 
And this second figure is called the L2 norm, which is nothing but the square root of the sum of squares of the coefficients. Uh, and as we see, as, we, as, as the L2 norm increases, uh, the mean squared error decreases first and then increases. So we, we again have, have a point where the mean square error or the test mean square error is, uh, is, is at its lowest. Uh, so that's ridge regression. Uh, similar to that, uh, lasso uh, regression also is a shrinkage method. Uh, the only difference between ridge and lasso is in the shrinkage in the is, is in the quantity of the shrinkage penalty. Uh, so where uh, in the ridge regression we had lambda times uh, sigma beta j square uh, in uh, Lasso, we have lambda times sigma uh, uh, sigma uh, times the absolute uh, summation over the absolute values of uh, beta j. Uh, and comparing back to OLS, uh, whereas OLS coefficients were obtained by minimizing uh, the residual sum of squares, uh, Lasso minimizes a slightly different amount, which is the residual sum of squares plus lambda times uh, uh, sigma beta j, absolute. So this creates differences. So, so, the, so the changes in the shrinkage penalty uh, factor uh, creates a subtle difference between the ridge and lasso, which is very important for feature selection. So uh, in ridge regression, we used uh, sigma beta j square, uh, whereas in lasso, we used sigma beta j absolute. Uh, this means that when the value of lambda becomes higher, uh, the coefficients of lasso regression can be actually absolute zero. So, so this feature of lasso regression can act as a, as a feature selection strategy uh, where some of the coefficients are zero and we can completely eliminate that and work with the rest of the predictors that are left in the model Whereas, in, whereas Ridge, Ridge never does that. Ridge will keep on shrinking uh, the coefficients towards zero, but never will it actually make it zero. Uh, so depending on the use case, depending on what we are trying to do, uh, Lasso can help us feature select, whereas Ridge will never, uh, uh, will never move coefficients towards zero and, and therefore it cannot be uh, a, a method that we use for feature selection. Uh, and this is how uh, lasso looks when uh, for different values of lambda and for different values of uh, the L1 norm. Uh, as we see to the image in the left, we move uh, or we, when we change lambda from low to high, uh, there comes a point when different coefficients are pushed towards zero. So there is uh, so right around lambda. Uh, at a value of around 400 or so, we see a couple of coefficients uh, being shrinked to zero. And then around uh, like 1200 or something, we have another uh, variable, which is uh, the in which, which stood for income that was shrinked to zero and so on and so forth. So, uh, and at extremely high values of uh, lambda, the in all the coefficients are shrink shrinked to zero. So this, gives us a hint that uh, at around, uh, you know, beyond the value of 3000 or, or like beyond the value of 5000, the only predictor that is uh, remaining in the model is rating. So if you choose a really high value of lambda close to 5000, the only coefficient that we'll, we'll be left with in the model won't be rating. Uh, uh, and uh, we can apply a similar strategy to select the best possible value of lambda, uh, which is based on selecting the lowest test mean square error. Uh, and uh, the, this figure sort of displays how, we, how uh, the mean square error changes from, for different values of lambda. And, and yeah, so, so, so these are the two uh, shrinkage methods, uh, they work really well with uh, cross-validation approaches as well. So the idea there is to use cross-validation uh, to select the best value of lambda, which gives us the lowest uh, cross-validation, 
mission error and uh, use that lambda to either uh, select or either either select the coefficients or estimate the coefficients for range regression or to do feature selection uh, for lasso uh, uh, regression setting uh, here i was not very clear on this conceptual bit uh, if somebody can uh, throw some light on it that would be really great but what it seems is that uh, last so, so the so graphically or uh, geometrically uh since the equation of lasso uh, this is the equation of ridge uh uses uh beta j square uh it would so, so the so graphically it would take a circular contour whereas lasso would take more of a square shape uh and when the lasso constraints so so basically the lasso constraint have will have corners on each of the axes uh, and therefore it will in, intersect with just one uh, uh, with the ols line at exactly one point uh, whereas since the ridge regression has more of a circular uh, geometry it would have multiple points of contact with the ols contours uh, and yeah and that's yeah that that is i i did not understand why this is significant or or what what is the interpretation uh, of this uh, so if somebody has any other uh, uh, nuance to it that would be really great yeah in this case the 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 shape of this area is explaining why the mm -hmm. the first method does same doesn't doesn't get to zero. So okay. yeah, and it's related, you know, the absolute value. The absolute value works in that way. So it's not a circular shape. And they explain, even though they don't explain how they get the the shape, the size of the shape, they say that it's related mm -hmm. to lambda. So if lambda okay. is zero, the shape mm -hmm. will get into the last square estimation that is the point that you see there so even though they don't calculate it's just a conceptual it's more like a, a, a diagram to explain how it was mm -hmm. more than a graphic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. got it thanks Angel. uh yeah so uh yeah, so that those were the two uh, shrinkage methods. Uh, just to summarize real quick, uh, ridge uh, will help us. Uh, both of these methods are shrinking the coefficients towards zero. Ridge will never shrink them absolutely to zero, and thus uh, cannot be as useful in feature selection. Whereas lasso has the ability to shrink coefficients exactly to zero and uh, can be uh, used for uh, feature selection. Uh, in the next week, we'll see how uh, they uh, how to use cross validation uh, with lasso and ridge regressions to identify the best possible values for lambda in each of these settings. Uh, moving on, we now uh, talk about dimension reduction methods. Uh, uh, so, like what's comment. the best? Yes, yes. Uh, could you go back to the to the previous picture? Oh yes, uh, of the leaves and the and the, um, the blue regions. Uh, yes, because, because yeah. I was wondering uh, because lasso is like a, a similar to reach by changing the norm for the W coefficients to not use the L two norm of reach but to use the L one. I was wondering, uh, mm -hmm. well. For any p between one and infinity, we can define an LP norm. So what happens if we consider another generalization of reach and, and, and of lasso? Mm -hmm. When we consider maybe an L3 mm -hmm. norm or L, L6, I don't know. But and, and in the link that I just shared in the chat, uh, they go a little bit into why p 
at least should be greater than one uh, because it ensures you that there is some uh, easier way to perform some optimization for the minimization that we want uh, because some, some function happens to be convex. Uh, but, but now, if we focus in the picture, it also makes sense uh, why, we would, why we would want P to be one uh, and not perhaps, I don't know, like a hundred or such. And it, it comes down, it comes back, sorry, uh, to the comment that Derek mm -hmm. made uh, because mm -hmm. for that shape in blue, that we can see that this is like a, a tilted, sorry, a rotated square. As we change P, mm -hmm. uh, let, let's say we blow it up to infinity, then that square mm -hmm. again becomes a square but uh, now its corners are not intersecting the, the, the axis. So we would expect a type mm -hmm. of intersection as we see in the picture in the right, where the, the intersection with mm -hmm. such a uh, red force is not happening in the axis where, where we want for, for some coefficient mm -hmm. to, to shrink to zero. So I, I, mm -hmm. again, I, I hadn't thought about that before, but. Uh, even uh, with this visual intuition, there is some value in why we want P to be one for this specific norm mm -hmm. and, and not any other value. Yeah. So uh, just to summarize, when we so when we keep moving the or keep increasing the values of P, uh, the contours for the OLS will will intersect. With the with the shape of the LP norm in multiple points, so lasso is the only uh, condition where the contour will meet the uh, 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 will meet the lasso at exactly one point. For all other cases, it would meet at multiple different points. Is is that a, a, the correct way of thinking about it? Yes, that sounds good. Is the intersection okay. unique uh, at the corners or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so when P increases, it won't be unique anymore. Okay. Got it. Thanks, Pushio. Uh, that was, and that link seems very helpful. I'll read into that more. Okay, uh, next uh, we have dimension reduction methods. Uh, so the overview here is that while best subset selection and shrinkage methods used the original predictors uh, and used different strategies to reduce the variance, dimension reduction transforms the predictors before use. So the idea is that for P predictors, if we can find a set of Z1 to Zm uh, a vector of Z1 through Zm, where Zm is given as uh, sigma phi uh, xj, uh, where phi is, a, is is some constant. Uh, if so, if we can find, if we can sort of transform uh, our the set of predictors x into a vector or, or a set of like components z, uh, then we can use that, we can use the set of new component Z to predict Y in a very similar way that we were, that we were using for a linear regression model. The only difference would be that for X, we were using, I mean, when we were using a normal linear regression, we were using all the predictors. But now, uh, if we have this set of uh, components Z, uh, which are much lesser than the set of vectors X, we can use the same linear regression model, uh, but it can, but with very few predictors now. So, uh, so this transformation of the entire set of predictors where X goes where uh, from, from X1 through XJ into a set of new components, Z1 through Zm, where M is much lesser than P, uh, the, the new model that we will create uh, will often outperform the linear regression model that used uh, the original set of predictors. Uh, 
and the idea here is that uh, uh, so there are there are like a couple of ways to go about uh, these dimension uh, reduction techniques the first one is uh, the principal components regression uh, or a principal components analysis uh, so principal component analysis chooses uh, these phi's uh, in such a this quantity phi in such a way so that it captures as much of variance as possible uh, now in order to catch or capture the most variance uh, the first component or the first principal component uh, will need to be in the direction in which uh, we have the most observations so so this green line will be our first observation because most of the variation in this particular data set is along this axis uh, similarly once we have that component once we have explained variance along that component uh, the next component will be sort of orthogonal to the first component uh, because the because that direction has the most variation or the most variance once the principal component has explained most of the variance in the principal axis uh, graphically it helps in thinking if uh, if we think about that first component and then rotate that to the x axis so uh on the left we have advertisement spending and population in the y and x axis respectively and we have the first component in green line and then uh, we think about visually we think about uh, rotating that in a way that the green line now becomes the x axis and that becomes our first component uh, so that uh, the next axis or the next component would be sort of orthogonal to it and uh, yeah so to summarize pcr the key idea here is that often a small number of principal components will be sufficient to explain most of the variability in the data so we will not so the idea is that if we are able to summarize our set of predictors of x1 through xj uh, into a smaller set of components z1 through zn uh we will be able to explain most of the variability in the data and we will avoid problems of overfitting by reducing the number of variables so using a pcr will lead to a lower variance as compared to using all the predictors uh, in our data now a challenge with using pcr is that uh is that it assumes that our set of predictors x1 through xp are correlated or they are they are sort of associated with the response variable in some way so if you remember when we were creating the set of components z we did not consider the response or the predictor in any way uh, we were just try we were just trying to find a set of uh, components z uh that would explain most of the variance in the predictors uh but but yeah they might be completely unrelated with the response variable or our outcome and this is a major assumption if this assumption fails then our entire predictive uh power of the model fails uh so pcr is only good when we have carefully selected the original set of predictors in a way that they are conceptually and uh, empir empirically associated with our outcome uh and uh, that is where uh, that that is the biggest issue of uh, pcr i think uh because this is uh creating uh the set of components in a very unsupervised uh, way uh this particular example shows uh the use of uh, pcr i will not get too much into it uh but we see that uh, to the right hand side of the graph with in by increasing the number of components the uh test msc first decreases and then uh, sort of staggers uh, a bit after 30 or more components uh, and uh, however what is more important is uh, that towards the beginning of it where we have uh, 
very few components, we see a sharp decline in the test MSC, which, which is what uh, the PCA is uh, really good at doing. Uh, so with that, we uh, close on PCR or principal components regression, keeping in mind that uh, the biggest assumption here is uh, that the predictors were actually related to the response uh, and we have carefully chosen the predictors uh, because PCR uh, identifies the components in a very unsupervised way. The next dimension reduction strategy is called partial least squares uh, and it uh, addresses the common issue of uh, principal component regression. Uh, so in a, uh, yeah, in a in a partial least square, uh, we are using in a, like a supervised approach as compared to the unsupervised approach in PCR. Uh, the only difference between PCR and PLS is that PLS will also consider the response variable y while creating the while identifying its components. So. The PLS approach is to compute the first direction Z1 uh, by setting each phi equal to the coefficient from the simple linear regression. So uh, in PCA, we were selecting phi by not considering the outcome at all. Uh, whereas in PLS, we are we'll be we'll be setting phi j1 exactly equal to the coefficient from like a crude linear regression between y and xj. And the idea here is that uh, the coefficient uh, from these crude linear regressions would be proportional to uh, the correlation between y and xj. Uh, and thus, in a way, we are sort of waiting uh, the model or we are waiting uh, the creation of each z1 uh, where the PLS will place the highest weight on the variable that has the strongest coefficient between the response Y and the predictor X. Uh, and that's exactly what, that's exactly the idea behind PLS. Uh, I, uh, yeah, so in, in this image, as we see in figure 6.21, uh, the the dotted green line is the line for uh, uh, simply using PCA without considering the response variable y. Uh, but using PLS, we see that the line is now slightly more tilted towards uh, population, indicating that population is a stronger predictor of the outcome sales uh, as compared to add. So here we see that uh, while both ad and population are important and it's, it's kind of weighting uh, or giving a slightly higher weight to population. Uh, I think when we, uh, I, I've not experimented with this on other data sets, but if we have predictors which are completely not related to uh, the outcome, uh, it can really help us uh, weight uh, the components in such a way that that uh, predictors which are not associated with the outcome at all are given much lower weight and they, they have a, a, a very lower say uh, in determining uh, the components uh, and, and yeah reducing the dimension. So that was a snapshot of uh, dimension reduction methods, uh, specifically principal components reduction and uh, partial leads, least squares uh, methods. Uh, we see that we have a, we have uh, a couple of methods for, uh, for linear model selection and regularization. Uh, and uh, each, of, each of these methods come with their own uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, uh, we have uh, methods such as uh, the best subset uh, selection, which is selecting a subset of the predictors in a data-driven way. We have shrinkage methods, which is shrinking uh, the coefficients towards zeros in a way so it's uh, uh, in a, in a way that it's 
penalizing uh, models to have a higher number of coefficients. And uh, we also have dimension reduction methods, which are not using the predictors directly, but using a transformation of that predictors in the form of components uh, and uh, giving us both supervised as well as unsupervised methods to do that. Uh, so I'll stop here for today to see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, and we'll pick up uh, the exercises next week. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, thanks, Lucio. Uh, thanks, Angel. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here and thank you so much for your time. Uh, I was not able to attend uh, the earlier presentations uh, due to time conflicts, but I have been uh, seeing the videos later and it has been very helpful uh, to go through the discussions and the exercises that all of you uh, have been uh, having. Uh, so thank you for uh, your time and thanks for all the uh, insights that I have been getting from all of your uh, classes prior to this. Great. I'll see you all next Enjoy. week. Yeah. Okay, bye everyone. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. All right. Bye everyone. See ya.